Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome. Um, it's good to see a goodly number of you here tonight um, to hear what will undoubtedly be a very, very entertaining talk on how Australia goes to war, lessons from Vietnam. Um, our distinguished um, seminar leader tonight is uh, Dr. Peter Edwards, who is very widely regarded as uh, a leading authority on Australia's involvement in the, in the Vietnam conflict. And um, it, uh, it will be very useful to, to share his insights tonight. He is um, well known as the official historian of Australia's involvement in Southeast Asian conflicts. And uh, he has recently published Australia and the Vietnam War, a book which many of you have already acquired this evening, which is wonderful, uh, with Peter's inscription in many cases. And you will have the opportunity to purchase that afterwards also, if you would like to. Um, Dr. Edwards is a writer, historian and biographer who has published extensively on Australian and international history and politics, not just on, on Vietnam. He's currently an adjunct professor of Deakin University and he has in recent times held professional appointments at Flinders University in South Australia and the University of New South Wales in Canberra. So it is my very great pleasure, Dr. Peter Edwards. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation to come here. As, as a lad who grew up in Perth and is now living in Melbourne, I can assure you that any invitation to come to Brisbane uh, between April and October will be really <laughs> We're about, we're becoming almost inundated, I think, with uh, the commemoration of the centenary of the First World War and especially the centenary of Anzac. Now, that's all understandable enough, but there's a problem with that because we Australians tend to think about issues of war and peace uh, in all sorts of ways uh, in connection with anniversaries. Uh, and it's an unfortunate coincidence that the centenary of the uh, First World War coincides with remarkable precision with the half centenary of many of the major dates uh, to do with Vietnam. Uh, in August this year, of course, we'll note the guns of uh, August that uh, brought out, uh, that initiated that cataclysmic con, uh, conflict. Uh, but that might obscure the fact that in that, the first week of August will be the 50th anniversary of the Gulf of Tonkin incident and the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which led to massive American participation in Vietnam. And for Australians, it's even worse because the centenary of Anzac coincides to the week with the announcement of the commitment of the 1st Battalion of Australian Infantry uh, to Vietnam. That was in April 65. I think that's unfortunate because the lessons of Vietnam, or as I shall explain, the Vietnam era, and I'll explain one, but you'll see why I think that's important, are, many, are in many ways more relevant to our current and likely future challenges. Now, when we look about look at war, there's two main themes that tend to dominate uh, public conversation and also, to a large extent, academic uh, research. One of them is memory. Memory studies are huge in academia at the moment, uh, <clears throat> and uh, as we investigate questions like when we say, "Lest we forget, we will remember them." What exactly are we remembering? Who do we remember? Why do we remember this battle but not that battle? This war but not that war? This unit but not that unit? Uh, and it's a valid question, and it's, uh, it throws up some very interesting, uh, interesting ideas. The other great uh, trope, if I might call it that, is trauma. And I know we have a, an expert on uh, post-traumatic stress and related matters uh, here. Um, but there's an enormous amount of discussion of, about the trauma suffered by people at war, by people when they return, by their families during and after war. Now, both those themes, memory and trauma, are extremely important. They're valid in their own right. But sometimes it seems to me that they draw attention away from asking the strategic questions. How and why it was that Australian service men, and these days service women, came to be committed and to be put in harm's way. How wise were the decisions of governments to commit forces to some conflicts, but not others? 
and whatever we may think of Malcolm Fraser's uh, book, at least he's put the, that right back on the agenda, for which, I'm, uh, uh, which I think is good. But when it comes to discussing questions of war, public discussion often uh, descends into two rather easy and conflicting tropes. Either the wisdom of the decision is simply assumed, and we pronounce that all the casualties gave noble service and sacrifice for our freedom, uh, and we don't question or we don't have any nuance about that. Or we go to the equal and opposite uh, view. Uh, all we've done is fight, quote, other people's wars, uh, meaning that all the deaths, all the uh, casualties, all the trauma were futile. Now, I think the Vietnam War has a lot to do with that latter uh, idea. I would suggest that there, after 1975, there was a lot of reading history backwards after Vietnam. The idea that Vietnam was not our war, it was America's war, uh, became entrenched. And people then contended that nearly all of Australia's wars, with the principal exception of the Pacific Campaign during World War II, were other people's wars fought essentially for Britain or American interests and not our own. So I think we need to re-examine some of those concepts. But instead of, well, as well as thinking about memory and trauma, important as they are, we might think about something else again, uh, a term which is not often uh, discussed in this country, statecraft. How do governments decide which wars to become involved in and how well do they handle the commitments? Nearly all wars really are wars of choice. How wise and how well handled are those choices? And as I say, after Vietnam, just about anything associated or that could be associated with Vietnam was regarded as discredited or fun uh, fundamentally flawed. That included the, the US alliance, the domino theory, the whole idea of sending expeditionary forces overseas. Anzac Day in the 1970s, everybody th uh, was saying that Anzac Day would be uh, a thing of the past by the, the turn of the century. Instead, of course, it's uh, totally different. Even uh, Australia's military traditions were all regarded as suspect. Vietnam veterans themselves were seen only as damaged people, mentally and physically. Now, much has changed. We have, for the second time, a Vietnam veteran as Governor General. That would have been inconceivable uh, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and we have Labour Prime Ministers proud to assert that uh, we are a loyal American ally. In fact, uh, next month, I think, um, Tony Abbott's going to make his first visit to uh, the White House as Prime Minister. And as you no doubt know, uh, the <coughs> On such occasions, if there isn't a major topic, obvious topic uh, of discussion, the two sides often agree on what's known as the, the announceable, uh, something nice that can be announced to show how well both sides are getting on. Well, three years ago, there was such an occasion when Julia Gillard made her first visit to the White House as Prime Minister, and the announceable on that day was that the Australian government will be donating $3 million of Australian taxpayers' money to ensure that the new Vietnam Veterans Education Centre in Washington, next to the, the, Vietnam, the famous Vietnam Wall, uh, a sort of combined museum and memorial, that that uh, education centre would have a significant Australian input to show, to remind policymakers and the American public at large that they had a loyal Australian ally in Vietnam. Now, if you had said in the 70s and 80s that, that's, uh, that a Labour Prime Minister would announce something along those lines in a visit to the White House, you'd have been regarded as, you know, well, seriously damaged. <laughs> so let's look again at the general strategy of not just the Vietnam War, but what I've called the Vietnam Era. The, South, the era of Southeast Asian conflicts from the late 1940s through to the end of the Vietnam War in 1975. The general strategy that Australia applied at that time uh, was 
was generally known as forward defence. Now, after Vietnam, it was that was generally derided and denounced. It was supposedly racist and crudely ideological. Uh, we were said to be fighting an imaginary enemy. We were conflating fears, traditional Australian fears of the red peril and the yellow peril, combining them all into a simplistic notion that we must fight them up there before we have to fight them down here. Now, I have to admit that uh, some of the propaganda, some of the political uh, statements that were made at the time, not least election posters during the 1966 election, did contribute to that sort of uh, idea. But what I want to suggest to you today is that forward defence at its best was rather more nuanced and sophisticated than that. In fact, I think that forward defence had the makings of something which um, strategists uh, like to call grand strategy. Or the British prefer that phrase, the Americans sometimes prefer the phrase national strategy. And in fact, it's, and this may sound a bit of an oxymoron, it's a modest grand strategy. Because what I think happened during the period from the <coughs> from 48 to uh, onwards, was that a sort of template emerged, and particularly after the Korean War of the early 50s, a template emerged by which the Australian government decided which conflicts it was prepared to commit Australian forces to and under what circumstances. And there were several criteria, several elements of this. Firstly, and perhaps most importantly, Australia was only going to commit forces. It would only fight in Southeast Asia. Now that may, that seems obvious enough in retrospect. It was the, you know, the great ballroom uh, of politics at the time uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and obviously very close to us. But it meant that we quite explicitly said we're not going to fight in the Middle East, despite the fact that our major military ally at that time, Britain, was pressing us very hard uh, to do so. The, uh, <clears throat> uh, there was a real fear of a Third World War against the Soviet Union, and the British military and political leadership were saying, if that happens, we want you Australians to come once again to do as you have done twice in the past and fight uh, in the Middle East, protect the Suez Canal and the Arabian oil fields and so on. And the government of R.G. Menzies uh, said no. We're not going to do that. Despite all those fresh memories of Tobruk and Alamein and all that, no, we're going to focus uh, on Southeast Asia only. And secondly, we only fight alongside the United States, the United Kingdom, or preferably both. Now, this was, uh, you'll recall that Menzies used to speak frequently of how close we were to our great and powerful friends, by which he principally meant uh, Britain and the United States. But what's often forgotten is that uh, what he was doing is what uh, people always say is a fundamental element of strategy, and balancing your resources against your commitments. By speaking so much about our, how close we were to our American and British allies, he was able to put a fiscal limit on defence. And with all the discussion that's going on now about what level the uh, defence expenditure should be, it's not I've always realised that forward defence allowed the government of the day to put not just a percentage, a percentage of GDP uh, limit on, but an absolute expenditure limit. So that as the economy grew, that amount uh, represented a smaller proportion of, of, uh, of GDP year by year. Uh, <clears throat> so, and whenever the Americans or Brits said uh, we weren't spending enough, we said, ah, well, the, the, the best defense, you know, the best contribution Australia can make is to have a strong economy uh, and we, we must have, uh, the phrase then was national development, which is something close, I think, to what we would now call infrastructure spending. But the third element is this. Yes, we wanted to be, to fight alongside the United States wherever possible, because uh, it was far and away the greatest military power in the world. Its defense expenditure was roughly equal to all the rest of the world put together. 
but that didn't mean that we had unrestricted, unreserved uh, faith in American judgment, and particularly American political and military judgment. One element of that was what I have uh, like to call the MacArthur Syndrome, going back to uh, the experience of the Korean War, where MacArthur was regarded as a, uh, a brilliant general, and you know, the Incheon landing was a brilliant strategic move that saved the Korean War. But you'll remember he pressed on to the Yabu and, uh, in a foolish way, which uh, brought the Chinese into the war and was almost disastrous. And there were various other examples during the, um, uh, during the 1950s, the Kwamoi um, Matsu crisis and others, where the Australian government was very suspicious of the American high-level polit uh, political and military decision-making. And for that reason, it always wanted to have others involved, preferably the British, because there was a strong feeling that the, the Americans had the military power, but the Brits had much more experience and much more, much better judgment in which wars to get into and which, other, and which not to. But also, we like to be in a multilateral and preferably multi-ethnic environment. This again uh, came partly out of the Korean experience. We were in a 16-nation coalition. <clears throat> uh, we like to, to be in what the diplomats call in good company. Uh, and so during the 50s and 60s, we talked a lot about fighting uh, with our Commonwealth partners, uh, and we talked a lot about CETA, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, meant to be a sort of Southeast Asian equivalent to NATO. Uh, it proved rather flawed, uh, and you know it became discredited afterwards. But the Australian government clung to it for a long time and tried to say that its commitments were consistent with CETO, even when that was stretching um, uh, the facts to their limit, um, because we wanted to be in that multilateral environment to exercise some degree of control over American military command. They had the strength, but we didn't want, we didn't trust their unilateral uh, judgment. <coughs> then within Southeast Asia, it wasn't a matter of, uh, with, uh, to Southeast Asia in general. It is clear, and I think this is uh, part of the weakness of uh, Australian thinking at the time, we knew lots more about some parts of Southeast Asia than others. We were always more interested in, um, and one might borrow the, um, uh, the Russian term, the near abroad. In other words, we were always much uh, more interested in and had more knowledge about the band of islands and peninsulas to our immediate north, uh, what today are the, the countries of Malaysia, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, uh, and their neighbors, East Timor, and so on. Uh, but especially Indonesia. So, and furthermore, our allies weren't given carte blanche. We would give them rhetorical support because our fear was always that they would withdraw from the region, but we challenged their military policies, we challenged their diplomacy, and on many occasions, but not all, as I'll discuss, we exercised some strongly independent diplomacy in the region. And the last criterion uh, 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 by which you should judge a strategy, I think, is does it have public support at home? You obviously have to have domestic uh, political support, and that brings it into the area of private politics. It's obviously desirable, if you can, to have a policy which is either bipartisan or which has the opposition divided and on the run. The question is always, uh, and I'll come to this, which comes first, the policy or the politics? So with those criteria in mind, let me look very quickly at the three military commitments that Australia engaged in during this era. The Malayan Emergency, 1948 to 60. The Indonesian Confrontation, 63 to 66. And the Vietnam War, in which we were involved uh, from 64 through to 75. 
Firstly, the commitment uh, to the Milan emergency. I won't go into all the, the details. You will, of course, read the book uh, <coughs> to, uh, to discover that. But let me just make a comment on how the decision was made. The major decisions came up when Menzies was a new prime minister, newly elected in 1950. He came in with a, a reputation for giving enormous, of being most the most Anglophile prime minister uh, imaginable, uh, supporting Britain and very anti-communist. And yet, when the Brits said, please give us strong support in our campaign against the communist insurgents in Malaya, the support, the rhetorical support was strong. The actual co uh, commitment on the ground was very cautiously handled. Menzies and his ministers asked very probing and serious questions about the relationship and the balance between communism and nationalism that was going on. Uh, Asian nationalism was one thing, communism was another. The two were intertwined in a very complex way. They asked the, the probing questions. They got into the whole question uh, with the aid of uh, good diplomats, the, the whole subtleties of the ethnic balance between the Malays and the Chinese in what was then Malaya. They worked closely with the emerging Omno leadership uh, that was emerging in Malaya. The Australians questioned the uh, British strategies. They especially questioned the role and purpose of bombing in a counterinsurgency campaign. The British were asking for bombers, and we said, what relevance uh, is that in, in this sort of war? We got leading British officials to come to Australia to make the case, both to policymakers and to the general public, uh, as to why the British should be involved. We also sent a military mission, a very high, uh, um, high caliber, uh, if I may use that phrase, uh, military people to Malaya to make their own independent assessment uh, so that the public could see that we were making our own independent assessment and even to advise the British on what the tactics on the ground and the strategy should be. We thought that we, we knew more about jungle fighting than the British on the basis of the new, new Guinea campaign. It was perhaps a little ambitious. And finally, we did not send troops, despite the request in 1950. We sent transport aircraft, which is much more politically acceptable. And very reluctantly and under special circumstances, we did send bombers. We assured that, uh, we ensured that Australians were placed in high levels of uh, command so that an Australian uh, RAAF officer commanded, uh, for a time, all British and Australian Air Force units. We didn't send combat troops until 1955. By that stage, the war had essentially been won. Uh, the troops were involved in what were generally called mopping up operations. Victory wasn't, didn't come until 1960, but it was pretty clear by 55 uh, that uh, victory was assured. And we fought using tactics developed by the Brits alongside Britain and New Zealand and other Commonwealth troops uh, in ways that we were comfortable with. And 1955, of course, coincided with the, the Labour split, so that troops to Malaya, although we sent very few troops and they, you know, they, uh, <coughs> uh, they weren't involved in major campaigns, as it were. Uh, but it became a test case for the split in the Labour Party uh, between those who were breaking off to form uh, what became the, the DLP uh, and the, uh, the remaining Labour Party. So there was a huge political benefit. But that wasn't the object of the exercise. Um, the Menzies government handled it the way they did, and they, there were some uh, domestic political uh, benefits that spent on it. <coughs> Now, the success of the Malayan emergency in 1960 gave the military confidence that the Australian <coughs> military knew how to fight this sort of war. It gave our polit politicians, Menzies and uh, his colleagues, confidence in the ability of the Western powers to intervene in a post-colonial uh, settlement in Southeast Asia to ensure that the non-communist side would emerge victorious. <coughs> So it's, you know, forward defense seemed to be working extremely well. 
The trouble came in the early 60s when we had two different conflicts uh, arising with our two great allies that we wanted to, both of whom we wanted to work with, pulling in different directions. There was the Indonesian confrontation. Britain was saying uh, to Australia, look, the major threat in this part of the world is Sukarno. He's, uh, he's uh, confronting uh, this new federation of, of Commonwealth country of Malaysia. Uh, <coughs> Sukarno is a real threat. They compared him explicitly with Hitler said he had ambitions to conquer all of, uh, virtually all of Southeast Asia and into Melanesia. Um, <clears throat> uh, at the same time, they were saying, don't get involved in Vietnam. We've kept out of that since about the mid-50s, and we recommend, you know, the French got a hell of a hiding, don't you guys get involved in Vietnam. At the same time, the Americans are saying to Australia, look, you can handle this Indonesian situation very comfortably, you guys can handle it. Don't do it provocatively because you'll just drive the Indonesians uh, into the hands of the Chinese. Um, the real conflict, the real challenge in Southeast Asia is further north. It's in the French Indochina, in other words, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. So we had those two conflicts going on side by side, pressed by our two allies in uh, different directions. And what I want to point out today is the the great difference in statecraft in the way Australia handled those two crises. Take confrontation. Again, we were fighting alongside the British and other Commonwealth forces, mainly in uh, Malaysian, of course, and uh, New Zealand forces. We were giving rhetorical support and uh, urging the British to stay in Indonesia, not to pull out. But at the same time, behind the scenes, we were giving very strong challenges to British policies and British assessments. Well, a notable uh, element was the, uh, the role of the then Minister for External Affairs, Garfield Barwick, uh, and his department. We were engaged in very active diplomacy, particularly in Jakarta and in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, and we had very able diplomats in Canberra advising the government. And this led, led to the policy of uh, what was christened graduated response. Um, this it, it didn't just happen. It emerged out of very robust discussions, particularly between the Prime Minister's Department and the Department of External Affairs, as Foreign was then known, uh, about what to do. But that robust discussion uh, led to a sophisticated and nuanced policy. We were fighting Indonesians. Indonesians and Australians were killing each other, albeit in small numbers. And yet at the same time, we kept diplomatic relations open, we kept trade relations open, we kept aid relations open, we even had military officers in each other's staff colleges uh, throughout that war. It's a very interesting way to fight a war. We were very slow to commit combat troops. Finally, at the first battalion, after years of pressure from Britain and Colombo, I would say, we finally sent the first battalion of infantry in January 1965. I don't think you'll hear much about the 50th anniversary next January. Once there, our forces fought with our preferred tactics and methods. They maintained secrecy. They used very skillful uh, small unit tactics, um, and the government. Uh, achieved its policy, uh, pursued its policy, despite criticism from its own ranks, as well as some rather irresponsible opposition from the then leader of the opposition, Arthur Corwell. Uh, and there was a clear division, in fact, and it con this contributed to the split between Corwell as leader of the Labour Party and his ambitious young deputy, Gough Whitlam, uh, all of which served in the, the government's political interests. The remarkable thing is that this was an exercise in what one historian has called best practice. It was great statecraft, and yet it was soon forgotten. Uh, in fact, my own brief when I was appointed to do the official history was to cover the Malayan emergency of the Vietnam War, but not Indonesian confrontation, which sort of fitted in the middle. And I, I thought this was crazy, but I had to fight very hard uh, to have confrontation included. Um, anything to do with Indonesia is actually more important, but it's so sensitive that we don't want to talk about it. 
even if we've done it well. Now look at the third conflict of that era, Vietnam, of course, the one that we all remember. The same principles, but the implementation was so very different. It was not a case of other people's wars. As far as Menzies and his uh, government was concerned, it was getting the Americans to fight our war. We saw what happened, you know, we saw the fate of countries in Southeast Asia as being very much uh, in our interests. A major factor in all this was Indonesia. We were really much more concerned with what was going on in Indonesia than we were in Vietnam per se. When the Americans uh, had what they called their More Flags campaign in 1964, calling upon all their allies to, to get with them uh, in Vietnam, we were one of the few that rallied. A major reason was because we were worried about American support in confrontation. At the end of 1964, when we introduced conscription and a number of other military measures, the famous uh, uh, ballot that uh, led 20-year-olds to, to go off to Vietnam, uh, the documents at the that went to cabinet at that uh, time said, well, we need to do it because there's a lot of conflict in the area and we may be facing three conflicts uh, in the region. The first and most obvious is an escalation of confrontation um, against Malaysia. The second one, which I, I fear that ran through this period, was that the Indonesians might cause trouble on the island of New Guinea because they had taken over control of West New Guinea we were still running East New Guinea, what is now the independent nation of Papua New Guinea, but at that stage an Australian uh, a mandate held by Australia. And we were dead worried that there would be conflict on an almost indefensible border in the middle of the island of New Guinea. Only thirdly did the officials point to a possible conflict somewhere in the on mainland um, Southeast Asia. It was handled very differently, but uh, there was no challenge in this case to American thinking, to what our ally was thinking, to its strategy. Um, Menzies, I think, basically assumed that the, the real danger was that the Americans would not get involved or stay involved, that they would pull out. As he <coughs> saw it, the danger was American isolationism, not American overreach uh, or imperialism. If you remember that Menzies was a young man in uh, forming political views in 1917, and that he was a young prime minister from 1939 to 41, it begins to be understandable. Mm -hmm. Anyone of that generation would tend to think that the real question is, uh, can you get the Americans involved in a war in which Britain, uh, the British Empire countries uh, are involved in? Once they're in, it's all over. Uh, they couldn't possibly be beaten. It was an understandable view if you came from that generation. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't examine it uh, as to whether that was still the case uh, in 1964-65. As we say, we, we knew, and I said, the Australian public, the Australian media, uh, Australian officials, uh, knew much less about mainland Southeast Asia than it did about the Indonesia, Malaysia, Papua New Guinea uh, area. We had no diplomatic representation in either Hanoi or Beijing to ask our own questions. Officials who did know something were sidelined quite deliberately. Menzies excluded the sort of diplomats who might have given him wise advice. At a crucial meeting on strategy, uh, in 1965, he sent only, uh, he didn't send any diplomats. He sent the only person I think he really trusted, the Chairman of the Chiefs of Staff, Air Chief Marshal Sir Frederick Sherger, who was given a brief to ask all, thoughts, all the right questions. He was told you are not to make any commitment. You are to ask how the, what strategy do the Americans have? How are they going to fight it? How are they going to be sure, how can you be sure that the South Vietnamese won't just sit back and let the Americans do all the fighting? How will the Russians react? How will the Chinese react? How will Hanoi itself react? Um, Sugar asked none of those questions. He didn't ask about the American strategy, which for a very good reason, they didn't have one. They were trying to work out what the hell they could do, and they, they simply didn't know at that time. 
uh, but Choga simply said, uh, we'll give you a battalion, I'm sure that's what you want, isn't it? Uh, the Americans at that stage weren't even asking for a battalion, they were asking for, we had <coughs> about 30, uh, no, about 80 advisors at that stage, they asked for a, about 150 or 200 more advisors. They weren't asking for a battalion, we gave them one. So what I'm saying is that the, the way it was handled had a huge effect on the outcome. There was no exit strategy in place. There was no limit on the duration or the size of the commitment. Uh, and this made it hugely difficult a few years later, by 68 or 69, when later prime ministers like John Gorton clearly wanted to get out and felt they'd been locked in. So in my view, in 64, 65, the Australian government probably had to do something in Vietnam uh, in its own interests. There was some validity to the, the, the domino theory. There was some validity in the insurance policy argument that we had to, to hold our weight to uh, in the, uh, the American alliance. And I can discuss later, if you like, uh, um, I can expand on that later. But my point is that the commitment should have been much more carefully handled as it was in the case of the Malayan emergency and Indonesian confrontation. And had we done so, the, the costs and benefits, the cost-benefit ratio, if you like, might have been very different. So let me just sum up by saying what are the lessons of that era for policy makers today. First and most obvious one is that Australia's strategic calculus, if I could use that phrase, the decisions for or against becoming involved in a, a war are not, this, not the same as our allies, even when ma alliance maintenance <coughs> is a major reason for involvement. I've just been reading Bob Carr's diaries, and there's a line in there where Dennis Richardson, his deep up little head, says, uh, says to Carr, our interests are not the same as the great powers. And Carr says, ooh, that's good, that's acute. Yeah, that's, <laughs> That's really sharp. I, think, yeah, I like that. And I thought, well, it might perhaps have occurred to you before. <laughs> the, the, the second lesson is Vietnam, in particular, was, in my view, not a case of other people's wars. As it was perceived by Menzies and those around him, in particular Menzies, I think, it was a case of getting the US to fight our wars not, and not to withdraw from the area. The next lesson is never underestimate the importance of Indonesia and its neighbours in Australian calculations. Always look at the role of Indonesia in matters which, on the face of it, are about the US-Australia relationship. I think that applies to Vietnam. I think it applies to Iraq and Afghanistan as well. And I could expand on that if you like. <clears throat> Beyond those overall considerations, I'd suggest the, le the lesson is that Australia needs something like a grand strategy, a national strategy, which puts in context not just military, but all our hard power and soft power assets. It, uh, it balances our resources and our commitments. It balances our alliance relationships with our need to have an independent diplomatic relationship, uh, with, particularly with our neighbours. It defines our primary strategic interests uh, so that we'll say, yes, these are so important that we will defend them militarily if necessary. Uh, but outside that, we can say no uh, to requests for assistance without jeopardizing our relationship. It seems to me that forward defense met a lot of those criteria. But as the philosophers like to say, that was necessary but not sufficient. You need to have not only a good strategy, but you need to implement it skillfully. And, and when you apply a strategy, and you implement it in each particular case, you need to have a clear political aim as to what it is that you're trying to do, and to have a military strategy which is capable of achieving it. You un and that includes an understanding that sometimes merely preventing or delaying a bad outcome can be a valuable contribution 
rather than having some unrealistic definition of victory, which you then have to keep uh, modifying as it uh, gets out of reach. Secondly, you need to exercise an independent diplomacy with a well-resourced, a trusted and confident diplomatic service. There's a lot of talk at the moment about how uh, run down DFAT has been over the last 10 or 15 years. I support all that, but it's not just a matter of how many embassies we've got and you know, what parts of the world they are. You need to have experienced and trusted people, uh, people in uh, whose judgment, people who are capable of thinking long term, uh, and in whom the government of the day has confidence. You need, even when working closely with allies, to make your own political and military assessments based on the best possible information and to know what's going on inside your allies' minds and uh, governmental structures as well as what's going on with your enemies. One of the things we knew a lot about what British officials were saying and thinking and where the arguments were and who was saying what and who was pressing for what. We knew much less about the Americans. We tended to accept that what if the White House or the State Department said something, well that was American policy. Uh, without realizing that Congress or any of the other players in the, uh, the game could have very different views and lead to different outcomes. You need to keep refining your military strategy to ensure that it's in tune with your grand strategy to keep your aims and means in balance. You need to have a clear exit strategy to control where, control how many people you send, the, the size, the duration of the commitment, and how and where they're deployed. You need to have clear rules of engagement, uh, and above all, don't deploy conscripts. Uh, and in terms of domestic politics, don't manipulate foreign or defense policy in order to get short-term domestic gain. That is likely to backfire. Uh, but if you have a sound policy, it will create political benefits uh, if it's well understood. <clears throat> so by those criteria, I think the Milan Emergency and Indonesian Confrontation score, file, score pretty high marks in statecraft. Uh, the Vietnam War, by contrast, was maybe a C plus B minus, uh, and it got rather <laughs> negative uh, after a, a few years. It's not just you've got to have the strategy, but you've also got to ensure that its implement, implementation is well handled if you're going to have a good outcome at the end. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Um, lots, of, uh, lots of food for thought out of that. Um, question, Brigadier General Alex Smith. Thank you, Dr. Edmonds. That was very, very fine presentation. I enjoy it very much. The subject of my question will be the power and effect of public opinion on Australia's commitments to imminent wars. Uh, it's alleged, and I don't know its authenticity, but President Nixon maintained at one stage that public opinion should be entered into the list of the principles of war. And people who don't know much about the principles of war they, of course, has been the stars from Sun Tzu's time through Clausewitz and to the modern day. The principle that he was encountering of public opinion did much to forge his opinion, and my, his opinion as far as the strategy of extricating from Vietnam, etc., because a lot was going on in America at that time in that regime. There were images that were coming from the press at that time that shocked us all, and without trying to illustrate that, that's a famous photograph that had huge impact, huge emotional impact here and around the world, and the huge impact on public opinion. In Australia, uh, I, I feel that perhaps this was getting to its height in the Maan time in, in, in government, and that our anti-war protests were becoming quite significant uh, in the public opinion and public, the public image on the Vietnam War was not good. Now, there at that stage, was there was visceral anger, in my, uh, and visceral anger that was based, in my opinion, on emotion and not intellect, really. 
however that went on. But it seemed to me that uh, an involvement like that in order to extricate the power and effect of public opinion has to be a factor of what you stressed in coming with a strategy, a grand strategy, to have an exit plan, an end game, if you like, an end game, and also at the same time adhering to the best of our ability to strategic association. Would you comment? <clears throat> Last week uh, I gave a lecture at the Command and Staff College, uh, which is doing a course on the strategy uh, for, uh, this is mostly uh, people about major and lieutenant colonels who are going to become colonels. Um, uh, and I was, it, it was in a course um, on strategy, and one of the main points I made was that the, the, one of the most important battlefields in the Vietnam War was not in Vietnam. It was the public opinion in the United States, the Western public opinion. Uh, and the Hanoi, which didn't have to worry too much about public opinion, uh, it was an advantage that a communist or other uh, dictatorship or authoritarian regime has. Um, <clears throat> but they knew that, that, that they knew that they had won the first Indochina war against the French simply by outwearing uh, the French. You know, the, the, the French were very keen on reasserting their colonial control after 1945, uh, and they just got tired of it because it, it was so costly by 1954, the time of Yimin, the, uh, you know, the casualty rate in, uh, uh, in officers. I think they, they were losing more officers each year than were graduating from their main military academy. Uh, uh, and uh, the cost, even though the Americans were actually meeting most of the cost, it was still pretty uh, severe on the French. So right from the start when the Americans became the enemy, they knew that the real battle was for American public opinion. They took a close interest in the protest movement right from the start. They made that very clear. Uh, and part of the problem was, as you say, you, you show the, the, the photograph of the, the famous girl, Tim Fook, uh, running down the street, the, the Nathan. There are, I think, five or six photographs which had a huge uh, effect on Western public opinion. Um, there was the, the monk in the mm -hmm. middle of 63, uh, barbecuing himself. Uh, then in the, the Tet Offensive, there was a Saigon police chief uh, shooting the, uh, uh, the Viet Cong capture during, the, during Tet. Uh, there was uh, that. And, and the, 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 the shots of napalm, uh, the shots of Agent Orange. Um, you know, half a dozen still photographs had an enormous impact. Uh, because it wasn't just the, the rights and wrongs of the war, it's the way that you do it. Uh, so you're, you're absolutely right, public opinion is a huge factor. Um, and you can see that, uh, that in the way that Western countries have handled the media uh, and so on in, in wars ever since. Onwards. Professor Ross Humphrey. Uh, Mr. President, um, it seemed to me that in the 60s, we suffered a lot from disinformation from the US about fear of China. And that part of the domino theory was that China would back Vietnam in its, uh, uh, its imperialist ambitions. And it would go down the, the northern plain of China, China Thailand, uh, like cheese. But uh, I just wondered. How much did our own diplomats swallow this business of uh, China supporting Vietnam when in fact they were traditional enemies? It was a, uh, I don't think anyone had a real understanding of it. Uh, only in the last year or two there's a book come out uh, by a woman of uh, Vietnamese descent um, now living in, in America. It's called Hanoi's War. <clears throat> and it's the most detailed and best documented uh, history yet produced of um, the war from Hanoi's point of view, including the intense uh, disputes that went on in, in the Politburo, and you know, heroes like Jap would be um, 
excommunicated, as it were, uh, and, and removed. And part of that was on the whole the, the extremely complex triangular relationship between Hanoi, Beijing, and Moscow. Yeah. Uh, now, yes, there, there was this uh, excessively simplistic view that Hanoi was simply part of a monolithic communist bloc, uh, and that, that that view was still being um, uh, portrayed even after the Sino-Soviet split was a matter of public record. Um, but the Chinese did give a lot of support uh, to Vietnam. What, what I think the West <coughs> failed to realize was that they didn't really want North, Viet or, uh, North Vietnam then, or all of Vietnam, to become too powerful. There was this traditional enmity. But it also suited China very well to have a, a war going on which was weakening both the United States and the Vietnamese. Uh, and they were showing how uh, they're showing their support for a fellow communist uh, uh, country, so, uh, sort of supporting their claims to be the leader of the global uh, communist revolution against their rival uh, Moscow. Um, Moscow had corresponding views. Um, the Chinese had something like 300,000 people serve mm -hmm. in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. They were never in the front line. Mm -hmm because Ho Chi Minh and his colleagues ensured, I mean, the, uh, the minute there was somebody who was identifiably Chinese was you know, shot or captured or whatever, you know, that would have had a huge propaganda victory. But the Americans were trying to win the war by bombing. Uh, that was rather futile because most of the arms and other supplies were coming from the Soviet Union and China in, uh, and other Eastern Bloc countries like Czechoslovakia. Um, and you couldn't bomb them without starting World War III. Um, but the anti-aircraft uh, uh, <coughs> operations, which uh, caused enormous having a, I forget the exact figures now, but the Americans lost a lot of planes and a lot of pilots um, in that campaign. That was Chinese and Soviet anti-aircraft. Um, uh, in fact, the, the there is somebody's done a, a, a sort of um, oral history of uh, veterans from, uh, including Soviets and Chinese, and the, uh, the Chinese recall that they were sent off to to fight in Vietnam with the, the clear instruction: your job is to shoot down more American planes than the Soviet guys are doing. <laughs> that was that was the competition. That, that's what it was all about. But the the uh, the domino theory was valid to the extent that. Ho Chi Minh could not have gained as much control as he did by 54, you know, even over North Vietnam, without having the support of China, having sanctuaries in China, having supply lines from either directly from China or through Laos, uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, uh, and also uh, through Cambodia as well, as it happens. Um, Soviet and Chinese support was immense, but there were also times when particularly the Soviet Union was uh, trying to advise the Vietnamese, look, we're after peaceful coexistence. You know, we, we don't want to provoke the Americans into uh, a world war. Can't you just take it easy a bit? And in fact, it was the Americans and the Chi uh, sorry, the Russians and the Chinese who convinced a very unhappy and reluctant Ho Chi Minh to accept partition in 1954 when they felt that they really earned the right to, uh, to control the whole country. Uh, and afterwards, it was by no means clear that, I mean, that there was a time when the Soviet Union indicated it was quite happy to have both North and South Vietnam in the United Nations. And Hanoi was very upset uh, about that. So the relationships between Hanoi, and Moscow, and Beijing were very complex, and that was not at all well understood uh, by Washington, let alone Canberra. Mm, thanks so much. Yeah. Professor Martin Stewart Fox. Um, I covered the Vietnam War uh, for United Press International from 1963 to 1966. Um, but I don't want to talk about that. I just want to come back to your point um, that whereas the uh, Malay emergency and confrontations were good examples of, of effective and sophisticated statecraft. 
getting into Vietnam was not. And you, you mentioned uh, Menzies and his thinking and so on. Uh, what always struck me was that uh, n not so much that, that uh, the effect of, on his thinking of how difficult it had been to get commitment from the Americans, both in the First and Second World Wars, but rather the Singapore strategy. Uh, and the Singapore strategy it, it was what Menzies uh, was uh, most in touch with during that build-up of the Second World War, that the idea that you had a great and powerful friend that in place in Asia between yourself and the enemy, mm -hmm. us and Australia and the enemy. At that time, the Japanese. And it's it. <clears throat> and it seems to me that it's that sort of strategic thinking that uh, uh, that, that brought Menzies to try to get the Americans on the ground, to understand that we were the only uh, power in 1964 uh, of, the, of the ones that the Americans canvassed who uh, had, um, reinforced the, the idea that the United States should go into, into Vietnam. E even the New Zealanders were, said, you know, be careful. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of the uh, lack of, of strategic sophistication at that time, it seems to me, uh, derived from uh, the fact that we wanted to get the Americans in on the ground, whereas in the case of the other two, the British were already in on the ground, we could look at what they were doing. We had more time. We had more opportunity to see uh, what was going on. We were not well informed about, about Vietnam. Uh, and so um, it was the necessity, <coughs> as, as Menzies saw it, because of his strategic, the, the formation of his strategic thinking during, uh, as a result of the Singapore strategy, that got us in on. on the, into Vietnam, and that could also explain the offer of the battalion before, before it was even asked for. Mm. I'd like you to comment on that. Well, thank you, and uh, it's a pleasure to see you. I've read a lot of your stuff, uh, and you're one of the few people who's written uh, intelligently and hopefully on mouse <laughs> uh, over the years, particularly in this period. Um, yes, I'm not. The, the Singapore strategy, I think, is relevant in the sense that, uh, in everybody's minds, not just Menzies, but you know, that all Australians of that generation, the idea of a dominant theory, the idea of a thrust uh, downward, was so real and fresh because of uh, the Japanese uh, southward thrust uh, in 41-42. Uh, yes, and the fall of Singapore, of course, was the you know, the, the ultimate symbol of that, and it was. Um, it was catastrophic, you know, I forget exactly what Winston Churchill called it, you know, the greatest disaster in British history or something close to that. Uh, and it was a disaster for, for Australian strategy as well. Um, uh, and, as, uh, and Menzies was of that generation where security lay in having um, friendly powers. And I think he had in mind France and, and the Dutch as well as uh, Britain and, and others, uh, conveniently to our north. Um, well, you know, the, the Dutch had been driven out of uh, Indonesia. Uh, the, the French had lost by 54. Uh, so you had to, uh, and the British were already going weak, as it were, on, uh, uh, on Indochina. Um, but he clung to the view that um, you had to keep the great Western powers in place, or Australia, Australia's security would be jeopardized. Um, so yes, I think it's all part of that that, that mindset. Um, I also think, if I might just add this, I think a particularly important phase in setting uh, this up and generally overlooked is the two years that Menzies was his own foreign minister. Uh, from January 60 to December 61. 
Uh, it was seen as a mistake at the time, and it, it certainly was. But what it meant was that he didn't have a foreign minister like Casey or Bao uh, who could say, look, even while you're handling, you Prime Minister are handling relations with uh, Washington and London, and you know you, you will take a particular interest in that, uh, but I, as foreign minister, can look around, can get a bit uh, more of the nuance of what's actually happening in Southeast Asia, and you know, get a bit more of a feel of what's happening on the ground. Menzies saw the, uh, you know, there were crises in Laos at that time, and he saw it, it was very much involved with it as an exercise in great power diplomacy. And it was all about which great powers were going to stand firm and which weren't. Uh, and I, I just, that was an opportunity lost, I think, for a bit of education as to the subtleties and the difficulties of operating uh, in mainland Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the last question from James O'Neill. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. It's very interesting. I just <coughs> perhaps refer to two, two matters that you touched upon but didn't mm. pursue. The first is that the extent to which these decisions made by politicians are actually outside the control. And the scenario which is created <coughs> has its own momentum. Mm -hmm. and going back to 1954, Geneva Accords, mm -hmm. after the defeat at Denver and Pew, mm -hmm. the, the decision was made there to have elections for the whole of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. The Americans refused to allow those elections to proceed mm -hmm. on the basis that they knew Ho Chi Minh would probably win. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then they sent their advisors and are built from there. Then you had uh, John F. Kennedy's speech at the American University in June 1963, in which he called for a totally different approach to foreign affairs. Mm. James Douglas suggested that he actually signed his own death warrant with that speech, and I, I, th I think there's a lot, a lot in that thesis. Mm. But he also signed National Security Action Memorandum 278, three weeks before he was assassinated, in which called for the withdrawal of all American troops from Vietnam by the end of 1964, 65, sorry. After he was assassinated, the very first memorandum that Johnson signed was reversing NSAM 278, and that led to the great growth of, of, of troops. Based on the lie, which you referred to, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which was entirely a false narrative given to us, and that, that's a characteristic of American foreign policy, getting into wars based on a lie, as we know from Iraq and from Afghanistan and so on and so forth. The second aspect uh, um, I'd like, like you to respond to is that uh, we see this in terms of what we are doing, you know, what effect it has on us, the trauma mm. for the soldiers and maybe the civilians uh, in Australia. We tend to forget that the trauma is infinitely greater that is visited upon the victims of our aggression. Well over a million Vietnamese killed, Agent Orange, uh, <coughs> and so on and so forth, destroyed the civil structure of their society. And we don't, I might even give enough thought to those consequences of our actions. Well, to take the last point first, I certainly think it, it is true. and. I think that in, if there's ever a consensus uh, in 
what uh, I think Bob Carr calls the internationalist orthodoxy of, uh, of American foreign policy uh, people. Uh, they would regard Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan uh, as all major strategic mistakes, uh, and pretty much for the same major reason that they underestimate the importance of local politics and, and look at whatever is happening through a global prism. Uh, the, the Cold War or the war against United and or whatever. Um, which is not to say that Australia has the same, uh, you know, the same interest. Uh, and what you say about the impact on the local people uh, is certainly correct. As to some of the other uh, points, you raise a number of very contentious points and there are libraries full of books arguing, for example, the whole question of whether Kennedy had he survived to, to a second term, uh, whether he would have withdrawn from Vietnam, uh, has been debated at enormous length. Um, and probably one of the leading uh, historians on this is Fred Logerwell, who's just won the Pulitzer Prize for his study of American involvement in the French war. Uh, uh, and I think he leans, but, uh, you know, it's, it's by no means a clear-cut thing to, to supporting that, that view. Um, uh, yeah, there was another point, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, yeah, but, but um, oh, the, yeah, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, yes. It wasn't a total lie, it was half true. Um, <laughs> the, the claim was that there were two, uh, two incidents. The first did take place, the North Vietnamese said so, uh, and, and it's clear that what happened was there were two things going on which were being <coughs> by different committees back in Washington who were talking to each other. Uh, and the Hanoi very reasonably thought that they were coordinated, uh, and they weren't. So they did attack a ship on the 2nd of August, I think it was. Um, then there was a report on the 4th of August that was almost certainly uh, non-existent. And in fact, the, uh, the naval commander said, uh, even at the time, hey, look, you know, our sonar operators might have got this wrong. Um, you know, it's possible that there were just sort of blips on the screen that weren't actually torpedoes being fired at us. But by that stage, the, you know, the, the, the political momentum was already taking off in Washington. At that point, I think we'll have to uh, wind up. Um, I will ask our Vice President, Dr. Caitlin Byrne, to deliver a vote of thanks to Dr. Edmonds. Thank you. Um, look, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is for me to be saying thank you to um, Peter this evening. We actually met a couple of years ago by phone when I took over the role of the book review editor for the Australian Journal of International Affairs, and I've never done this role before. Peter, of course, had been the editor-in-chief of the journal and has a long association with our uh, institute and we had a long conversation um, a couple of years ago now and one of the things that you know a couple of things that really were imprinted on me then Peter that I've been reminded of again tonight um, how generous you are with your time and your advice um, that you have a critical and a dispassionate eye on history and I think we've all benefited from that this evening um, let me check my notes because there was another point. I took so many of them. Oh, that you really have shared with us a um, methodical approach in viewing Australian history, particularly our history in war in Southeast Asia. Um, we often <coughs> like to categorise certain events into little pockets, but I think you've given us a much broader view of some of those events, particularly relating to Vietnam. Um, I noticed that you caution us against reading history backwards and what a great um, example you gave us in reminding us of the value of statecraft. And we're here talking about war, but you've emphasised the importance of an independent, capable, well-resourced diplomatic uh, corps or diplomatic service. And I think that we can never underestimate the role of diplomacy, um, the value of hard and soft power, and some of the lessons that we can learn from history that, that continue to remain valid for us today. So I hope you will join with me in thanking Peter in the usual way.